Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Victorious Church of God. Um, thankful to be here. Uh, wasn't planned, <laughs> but uh, appreciate the opportunity to do some work for the Lord. Um, uh, appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to say a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you tonight for another wonderful day you've given us, Lord, and truly we thank you for your mercy that you've had upon our lives, Lord, we feel so unworthy to be standing here today, Lord, uh, we really appreciate it for all you've done, and the help you've given us, Lord, your forgiveness, and your strength, everything you've done for each one of us, Lord, we ask you to please continue to to help us to grow in your grace and knowledge. Help us to continue to bear one another's burdens, Lord. And Father, please help our, our leaders, Lord, and our government, Father, and lead, lead us, Lord, in the way we need to go, Father. And just be with us in the service tonight. Please bless, Lord, in, in every way, Lord, and we give you the thanks and praise and glory appreciate each one that's here with us tonight, Lord. Just help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ken Van Buskirk. So I know it's a little different that we're not having a song tonight, but that's okay. We don't always have to do that. Um, so I felt kind of impressed after this morning to um, take what we learned this morning from the scriptures and go another direction with that. So if you would, just bow your heads with us and pray with us that the Lord would really help us tonight. I know Brother Robert just prayed, but we're going to pray for ourselves. So, Father, tonight we ask once again, Lord, that you would bless us with your presence, that you would be here tonight and grant wisdom in the lesson, dear God. Help us to see, Father, that we are truly instruments and tools in your hands. And Lord, we ask, dear God, that you would just help us, Father, to be able to uh, share the gospel, Lord, and to be able to uh, help those, dear God, who are seeking and who are searching, Lord. And Father, we'll certainly praise you. Lord, please touch those who are sick in body, especially Brother David, Brother Shane, uh, Sister Michaels, touch Brother Michaels, Lord, he's just exhausted. So many others, we pray. Uh, keep each one safe, we ask, dear Lord, through all of this uh, virus and stuff. And we put a rebuke on the enemy, dear God, and hold him away from the service. We ask you these things humbly in Christ's name. Amen. So I was thinking after this morning that one of the things that is so important for us to do but sometimes it's so hard to do is to win a soul, to win a soul. And so I got to thinking about how if it, meant, if it was meant for Jesus to win the world by himself and just his message, who he was, then there would be no reason for any discipleship. What, what did he cause, call disciples for? Why did he tell Peter, stop fishing and come and follow me? Well, he, what he was doing was, is he was establishing the message. He was making a way for men and women to be able to follow God and win people to others through him. And so when you start thinking about winning a soul, a lot of people will start, you know, one of the first scriptures, and I'm going to go ahead and read it because I wrote it down. It's in Proverbs chapter 11 and in verse 30, and we're not going to hold you long tonight, so... But it says, um, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now, before we read the second part of that, I just want to say that I don't believe it's so much words that can win a soul as much as it is conduct. And this is the reason why that I want to say that, because there's people who are, I'm going to call them for lack of words, better Bible thumpers. You know, they can just quote scripture after scripture after scripture. And what they're trying to do is they use that knowledge of the word of God 
in an attempt to try to get people to come to Jesus. And of course we have to have the Word of God to be able to do that. But remember that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So you have to remember that as you're using the Word of God, if you're not careful, you can be using it as a weapon instead of an invitation. And I've seen that happen. I've seen people who are so ready and willing to argue over the Scriptures, so ready and willing to get into these passionate discussions about what they think the Word of God means. And, you know, and I, I get that. I understand that. I mean, do we need to stand for the doctrines of Christ? Yes, absolutely we need to do that. But the question we got to ask ourselves, is that what's going to win a soul? Is that what's really going to make a difference to pe in people's lives? So I truly believe that it's not so much what we say, but what we do. It's how we conduct ourselves. I'll never forget as a young Christian, I had not been saved very long at all. And boy, I had such a desire and a passion to win a soul. It, would just, it meant everything to me. And I was working in a factory. And as I was working in this factory, you know, I was testifying to the people that I worked with. I was testifying to the people I worked with on the line. I was looking for any and every opportunity I could to share the gospel with them. And at different times, you know, it, it, it was good because people, I would share scriptures and different things, but I wasn't, didn't feel like I was using it as a sword. I remember one particular time, <clears throat> there was a man, him and his wife, he worked there and um, I was building him a deck in the back of his house. I got to be really, really good friends with him and... Um, we went to work one night, and a bunch of guys were all standing around in a circle, and somebody said, hey, man, you want to hear a good joke? And, um, you know, of course, everybody's like, yeah, sure. And, of course, the joke, and remember, this guy claimed to be a Christian, the guy who's telling the joke, so remember that. So the guy starts to um, tell this joke, and as he's beginning to expound on it, it starts to get off color. And before long, now it's not off color. Now it just gets to be plain nasty. Well, as soon as it got to be off color, I started walking away. And then I was so glad because I, I was able to just pick up a little bit of how it got raunchy, but enough to where I was walking away. So this guy that I'd been witnessing to and telling him about the things of God, he come up to me a little later and he goes, Hey, man, why, why'd you leave? Well, you know what? Why'd you walk away? And I said, You know, brother, I said... There, there was a time when I'd have been the guy standing over there telling that joke. But I said, that's not who I am anymore. And I said, I feel like that this is where Jesus lives. I truly believe this is his house. And I said, you know, I felt like that I had to take the presence of Christ away from that because I don't feel like that he wanted to hear it because I didn't want to hear it either. And he said, wow, that's amazing. He said, I never heard of anybody who was so guarded. And I remember he used the word guarded. And I said, well, it's not really a matter of being guarded because I think that Jesus was around people who were lost. But Jesus also was not around people who had no interest in accepting him as their savior. He either said, you can either accept me or not. He wasn't going to hang around where people just continued to do nasty and sinful things. That's not the way it worked. He went and tried to expound to them what being a Christian was and, and what accepting him was all about. And then if they accepted him, he was thankful. I'll give you a case in point. You see him go through Samaria and you see him sit at the well and he shares with that woman the gospel. He tells her, no, the one that you're talking about, he's the guy that's talking to you. And he sees a change in her, right? So I feel like that more than anything, what people need to see is the change that has taken place in our lives. Now we also know, and I've said it many times before, and I want to say it again, that our fruit is certainly one way that people will know that we're Christian, but our words are definitely another way that people are going to know that we're saved. Our conversation I don't believe, and I've said it many times, I don't believe that Jesus was crucified because of the miracles that he did. He was crucified because of the words that he spoke. There are times when those words need to be spoken, but is that the time when you first meet that person? Is that the time? I mean, it's, it's a little bit tricky, right? And so 
when we look at this scripture here, it says the fruit of the, of the righteous is a tree of life. In other words, if we're living what we're supposed to be living and people can see that, right? Then what they see is that they have an opportunity for life like we have, right? Let me say this, that a, a lot of things that's going on in the world with all this pandemic and everything else and people getting, you know, all the riots and everything that's taking place around us, I believe that what people need to see is someone who's constant. I believe what people need to see is someone who is settled, someone who is established, someone who, yes, they'll have that conversation with you, but they can still smile, they can still laugh, they can tell, still tell you about the good things that they have in their lives. If we're not careful, what we'll find ourselves doing in trying to win a soul is that we find ourselves just presenting the Bible to them instead of presenting Jesus to them. And I want you to know that, that this is a dead letter without the Spirit of God. If you're quoting this to someone trying to win them to the Lord and the Spirit of God is not with you, you are actually speaking dead words that are just going to fall to the ground because there's no life in them. So the part of this that we need to see, first of all, if you're going to win a soul, is you need to be living it. If you're not living it, you're not going to win anyone. If you're claiming that there is this great, wonderful life to be lived, and yet people see you constantly wallowing in the things of this world, they're not going to have any confidence in you to accept what you have. Not long, well, several years ago when we were up in the building up in Marion, there was a young man who come to services <clears throat> and you, you could tell that he was under conviction that God really, really did speak to him. And so I'll never forget that one night after we was having, I think, uh, a, a revival on the tabernacle, he met me at the back and he said, I'd like to talk to you about something. And I said, sure. And, and I still say this today that one of the greatest compliments that a preacher can ever be paid is you live what you preach. I believe that's one of the greatest compliments that a preacher and a Christian can ever be paid is you live what you preach or you live what you say. There's no more of a turnoff than for, somebody, for you to be talking to somebody about their soul and telling them how wonderful being a Christian is and then later on they see your conduct unbecoming of that of a Christian all you've done, is just, it, you've just sealed your fate to never be able to talk to them again. But he met me at the back door. He asked me if he could talk to me. And he said, this whole Christian thing, he said, I'm just, I'm so uh, confused about all of it. And I said, well, explain that to me. And he said, well, first of all, I want to say that I've, I've watched you and I appreciate the fact that you live what you preach. And I said, well, thank the Lord, brother. It's not going to be any good if I don't live what I preach. The next thing he asked me, he says, I work with all these people and a lot of these people claim to be Christian, man. And they, they tell me how, you know, that they love going to church and this, that, and the other. He said, so I was working with this one guy and he, and he was witnessing to me, Brother Ken. He was telling me about the things of God. And then at break time, he said, hey, you want to come out to the truck with me? And they said, sure. So he went, goes out to the truck with him and he pulls out a fifth of liquor from underneath the seat. And he says, here, get you a hit of that. People don't believe that that's... Right, that it's Christian, right? I mean, I'm going to have a hard time with a guy who's telling me that he loves God and you see him drunk every Friday night. That's difficult. It's not going to happen. So, first of all, if you're going to win a soul and you're going to have a real impact on winning souls, you're going to have to be what you say you are. If you're not then I would suggest that you get out of the soul winning business because you're actually in the way. I'm just being honest with you. I know that sounds hard, but you're actually in the way. A lot of people feel like that <clears throat> winning a soul requires this vast amount of wisdom. And I want to read this to you because this is what the scripture says. It said that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls <clears throat> is wise. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to have this vast amount of wisdom to be able to win a soul. But this wise that he's talking about here 
is he's talking about if you're going to win a soul, you're going to have to have a connection with the wisdom of God. That's the only way you can win a soul is that you are connected or tapped into the wisdom that God has. Because the Bible teaches us that if we lack wisdom to go and ask of him liberally and he'll give it to us. So I want you to know that, you know, I, I think I'll just use this for an example. If I want to win a guy to the Lord and the thing that he likes to do is play golf, well, I'm going to tell you winning him to the Lord's not a good idea for me to go golfing with him every Sunday during church. Because then he knows what I love, that I love golf more than I do God. And how are you going to win a soul that way, right? So what people need to see is consistency. They need to see us constant. They need to see that when we open our mouths, that before we do, that there is this wisdom that can come out that they know that you couldn't have made up, that, you, you know, that it had to come from somewhere other than you. Now, certainly that can be from the Word of God, absolutely. But it can also come straight from the throne of God as well. Again, just another personal story. I remember a young man who was laying some block over at Brother Randy's and Sister Becky's. and um, I had been witnessing to him for quite a while. He'd done a little bit of work for, uh, for Brother Tony. Brother Preston probably knows who I'm talking about. And so I remember one day I went over to visit Brother Randy and Sister Becky, and he come out from laying block. He's laying block in the basement. And we just started talking, and he brought up the subject about you know, being a Christian and how he felt that he was a Christian. He felt that he was saved. And he started asking me questions about how I believe. And I started telling him that I don't believe that Christians waller in sin every day. I believe that if you're going to be a Christian, you're not going to be living in sin because Jesus come to take away sin. So as I'm talking to him, I'm giving him all these scriptures, scripture after scripture after scripture. And they're coming to me, Brother Robert, like pop, pop, pop. And I'm like, God's got to be in this, man. I'm getting the scriptures like right, right, pop, pop, pop. And he just keeps looking at me, just totally dumbfounded. And I'm like, I remember saying, God, this ain't working. <laughs> it ain't working. So finally, it come to me, I'll never forget, it come to me about the way that Jesus got through to people was through parables. It, it's really how that, he was able to relate to them. Parables give him the opportunity to relate to who they were, Preston. So I told him, I said, brother, I said, if you went down that basement and you laid every one of the rest of those block wrong and you knew that you laid them wrong, I said, would you have the courage to go over there and ask them folks to pay you when you knew you did it wrong? And he said, well, of course not. I said, why are you going to live wrong and expect God to pay you then? He goes, Ken, now you got me thinking. After all those scriptures, right? Did he come to church, Brother Ken? Did you? Went? No, never did. You know why? Because he was indoctrinated with sin you will, sin you must, sin you can't help it. He thought he was fine. <laughs> no sin in his life. Sin in his life, but under the blood. I'm telling you, that doctrine's not going to go up very far. So... He says, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. So what we need to do is we need to be living a righteous life. In other words, we've got to be living right. If you're not living right, you will not have influence on those that are lost. So that's really, really important. I want to say tonight that if you're going to win a soul, you're going to have to be a person who has a burden for souls. You're going to have to learn to look at people not from the outside in, but from the inside out. That's hard to do sometimes in the world that we live in because automatically we look at people and we begin to stereotype them. And I'll give you a prime example of that. If I had on a cowboy hat tonight and cowboy boots and a belt buckle about the size of a hubcap, who would you think I was? I'm a cowboy. I'm probably riding bulls listening to country music, right? That's because that's the stereotypical idea that we have of people. You know, I, I just want you to know that if we walk through life and we see these people and we have interaction with them, that if you come across with this preconceived idea 
that you can't reach them because of what they look like on the outside, then you're never going to be able to reach anyone because you're looking from the wrong direction. You cannot look from the outside in. You have to look from the inside out. We know this is true going back to the example that we said about Jesus going to the well in Samaria. He wasn't supposed to be there according to Jewish law. So what we know is that one of the things that Jesus said before he ever went through Samaria is he said, it must needs be that I go through Samaria. In other words, he was being drawn there. And the reason that he was being drawn there is because he knew that there was a woman there that he could help, right? And so he went against what the religious world thought at the time and went to help that woman. And he did. Sometimes when we look at all the different avenues that Christ worked with people, you know, here's the thing. <clears throat> Let me get a drink of water before we start in on this one. I was talking to a man one time who claimed to be Christian. One of the things that he said to me was, he says, I ain't got time for those people who use drugs. Really? Really? So this is where a lot of Christians have gotten to, that we got all these labels on people and we can't reach any of them unless they try to meet this, unless they fit a certain criteria. I want to tell you that that is not how Jesus was. He was led by God. Would you deny that? No way. He was definitely led by God because he was God in the flesh. There were certain groups of people that he did not waste his time on because they were religious, not because they were in sin, but because they were religious. Religious people don't feel like they need to be converted. They feel like they're okay. Every once in a while, you'll find an honest heart in the, mo in the midst of them, and I thank God for that. But Jesus was led by God to those regardless of whoever else had given up on them. A prime example of that is Legion. Legion on the Isle of the Gadarenes. A man who was up in the tombs who they chained up and he ripped those chains off and he stripped himself naked and, and, you know, and he bit himself and cut himself and everything else. I mean, the man in our, in our modern day terms would be considered a mental basket case. We would uh, label him with mental health issues and say, you know, we'll put him on different meds and that happens. You know, I'm not pulling away from that. People need those. Those things are there. Those things are real. But this wasn't the case. This was a different case, right? So Jesus goes to the Isle of Gadarenes and he steps on the Isle of Gadarenes and as soon as he does, here comes this man to him, falls down at his feet and Jesus didn't shy away from him. Jesus didn't walk away from him. He helped him. So one thing that we've got to do is make sure that we're seeing through the eyes of God when we're trying to win a soul. Because he sees things, Brother Preston, that we cannot see. You and I may think we got a prime candidate in our hands, someone we know that's going to accept truth. And this is what we want to do. We want to get them in church, you know, because that means their soul is right if we get them in church. I just want to tell you this, that we need to get them in Christ. If you get them in Christ, they'll want to be in church. That's how it works. We think we've got that prime candidate in our hands and we'll spend time after time and day after day and minute after minute trying to win them to the Lord <laughs> only to find out that they were not interested or they was playing our religion to be able to use us in some different way for their benefit or their gain, right? No intentions of ever accepting Christ. So we got to see through the eyes of God. we got to be led by the Spirit of God. It needs to be sought after. It needs to be a burden. We need to have the right conduct. We need to have commitment to this or you'll never win a soul. It needs to be a personal work. It needs to be a personal work. In other words, it has to be a personal desire to win a soul. Do you know what influences that a lot of times? 
What influences it a lot of times is that we want to win a soul so other people can look at us as someone spiritual. That's not a personal work. When you do that, you're doing it for someone else. Brother, we ought to have nothing more than a pure, aching desire to win a soul for no other reason than to help that individual escape the torment of this world, of the world coming. To escape that eternal punishment. To have a desire to see them delivered. Not only that, but to see them enjoy the benefits of being a Christian. To see them love the joy of their, that there is of having a relationship with God. To have a desire for them not want, to not want to miss out on that. It's got to be a personal work. Another thing is, is that you're going to have to see the need to win souls. Is there a need to win souls? You know, we live in what's called the Bible Belt. The difficult problem with winning souls around here is it's hard to win everybody, anybody whenever everybody's saved. Or at least they think they're saved. We're going to get into that too. i got a scripture written down for that. I just want to remind you that in many places where you see Jesus having a conversation with the religious world, they're not good conversations. One place he said, you're like whited sepulchers. He said, on the outside you're clean and white, but on the inside you're full of dead man's bones. He was looking from the inside out. Remember that, if you're going to win a soul, you're going to have to look from the inside out. If you look from the outside in, you're going to get a preconceived idea and walk away from someone who might, you might have been able to share the gospel with. So, when we look at the need, one of the needs that we have in the religious world is for them to know and to hear, or for them to hear the truth. So how do we deliver that? How do we, you know, make that exchange? It's pretty easy to know when you start to have a conversation about the things of God with somebody whether they're honest-hearted or not. Because number one, they won't be defiant about what they believe. They'll be willing to listen and reason with you. I want to tell you something. that I don't care if you call yourselves Church of God or whatever you call yourselves, but if God can be reasoned with, then we ought to be able to be reasoned with as well. As a matter of fact, one of the Christian attributes is that we ought to be able to be reasoned with. If you can show me a better way, Brother Preston, I want to know what that way is because I want to live everything I can while I'm here on this earth and be the best Christian I can possibly be for God. But I've said it many, many times. Don't come and offer me a pair of britches with a bunch of holes in it when the ones I'm wearing are better than the ones you have. I'm not going to take them. we got to see the need. We need to see the need of reaching out to people. You know, I think about when we do vacation Bible school. I think about whenever we uh, do the fall festival and different stuff. There's so many different ways we reach out to people in the community, and there's so much opportunity there as well. And then those relationships begin to develop, and people begin to talk about what God's done for them and how God's blessed them. Friend, if you don't see the need that is in our world today for people to know God, you are about as blind as anyone could ever be. There is such a need for people to see God in our lives. When we begin to look at this, one of the things that we need to do is we need to know when to say something and when not to say something. I'll give you a prime example of this. You can be working with someone and so far it could have went really, really well and you could just be sharing with them and they're taking it all in and they're enjoying it and you're, you're making progress with them because I'll tell you something, winning souls is a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. You're not going to talk to someone one time and lead them to the Lord. It just don't work that way. Sometimes it happens like that, but for the most part, there's a lot of work involved in, in winning a soul, right? So you can put all this work in and up until that time, you could have followed the Spirit of God and obeyed God and the things that you said come from God, and people could see God in you. They could know that God was manifesting himself through you, and then you get in the flesh one time, one time, and you can absolutely ruin every bit of the progress you made 
because you just didn't know when to shut your pile. To be quiet. There was a time to speak and a time to be quiet. Right? So it's knowing when to share and when not to share. The other thing is, do you truly understand people's need of salvation? We've kind of come to a place today where ah, if they take it, if they accept it, they accept it. If they don't, it's no big deal. You know, hey, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not their savior. Brother Tony was preaching the other night and he said, we can't save ourselves and we can't save anyone else. And man, I agree with that 100%. I do. People need to see us though and know their need of their own salvation. They need to know that they need to be saved. How do we present that though? How do we present to someone a need that they don't even see themselves? Well, sometimes you have to tell people their need, why they need to be saved. I've done this with folks. You know, I, I've shared with people why they need to be saved. What are the reasons that they need to be saved? Well, I'll tell you one of the reasons that I feel people need to be saved is it is a better life. Boy, if they need to hear anything, they need to hear about the benefits there is of being a Christian, the benefits of being one of God's children. Boy, I'm telling you, whenever I'm talking to people, I'm going to tell them about the things that God's done for me, the miracles that he's worked in my life. I'll never forget one time again, we, that same factory, by the way, when I worked in that factory, we got 13 families out of that factory to come to church. 13 families to come and be in services with us. I appreciate God for doing that. But while we was working there, we was out at the park. And uh, on a Saturday, brother and sister Clark was with us. Morgan went down a slide and she was little. And she cut her pinky toe. She cut it all the way to the bone. And I remember picking her up and carrying her over there to the car. And I was absolutely frantic. I mean, there was blood dripping off my hand. I mean, that's how bad she'd cut her foot, Right? And I'll never forget, my wife said, honey, honey, because I was hysterical. Thank God for the voice of reason. Never forget, my wife said, honey, honey, just calm down. Let's pray. Let's pray. So brother and sister Clark was with us. I said, brother Clark, please pray for her. He prayed for her, and as God is my witness, the blood stopped instantly. And I mean it when my hand was full. It was running down my arm. Well, we thought about taking her to the doctor. We went back to the Clark's house. We didn't really know exactly how bad it was, but they got it all cleaned up and everything and pulled her little toe back, and sure enough, it was cut so far down in there you could see the bone. You know it never bled anymore? <laughs> so I can remember being at that factory, and instead of quoting Scripture to people and instead of telling them, you know, this is this such and such, verse and verse, you know what I was telling them? I was telling them about the miracle that God had done for my little daughter Morgan. And how real he is. And this is what the world needs to hear and they need to see. God is real. You need to tell them that there's benefits to being a Christian. My wife and I was talking and I, I love my wife so much. She was telling me, she said, you know, honey, I was thinking today about the Passover and how the blood was applied to the doorpost and the lintel. And as long as that blood was applied, bless God, that means that the death angel passed over them. And she said, you know, today, Buck, we got to have the blood applied. We've got to have the blood applied if, the, if we're going to have... I want to tell you, I believe there's benefits to being a Christian that we need to share with other people that God keeps us safe sometimes. He delivers us from the powers of evil sometimes. He actually helps us with pay our bills at times. He, I mean, he does. He sends people. This is what the world needs to hear, that there's a God out there who is still working. He's still doing great things. So we need to understand their need of salvation. We need to understand that salvation is a pathway for them in this life to the benefits of being one of God's children. The scripture said that we can come before the throne of God boldly to find grace to help in a time of need. Boldly, what that means is not in a haughty, high-minded, uh, privileged way, but in a way of relationship. 
It wouldn't be hard for me to walk over to Brother Robert and say, Brother Robert, I'm destitute. I'm, I'm broke. I've got this bill coming up. I know Brother Robert's a wealthy man. He's got millions. And I can say, Brother Robert, could you loan me $100? Wouldn't be hard for me to walk over there and ask you that, Brother Robert, because I know you. You know me. Now, it'd be a little more difficult for me to go ask Brother Tyler for $100. I really don't know that brother that well. We're getting to know each other a little bit better, but it'd be a little bit harder for me to say, hey, Brother Tyler, you want to loan me $100? I just don't know you as well as I do Brother Robert. When you know God, when you know his son, when you are part of the family, when you're one of the children, it entitles you. Yes, it does. It entitles you to the benefits of heaven. And this is what the world needs to see. This is what the... That is what the lost soul needs to hear. The benefits of being one of God's children. This one's really, really critical. And I'm getting close because I told you I wasn't going to hold this very long. Well, really, you guys out there in Facebook, I'm really not holding you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you're probably sitting on the couch, some of you in your pajamas, everything else. That's good. Um, anyhow... This one's really critical. You know, we need to learn to listen. Because a lot of people who are lost don't feel like they're being heard. I do want to say that Jesus was a good listener. Take the time to stop talking for a little bit. My wife and I was talking today, and even my kids are doing this because I'm learning to do this more and more and more, and I'm grateful for it because I keep myself consciously aware of it, and I think a lot of it has to do with my job. But I'll give them time, and I'll wait for a little while when they're done because I want to make sure they're done. So today, my wife and I was talking, and she said, honey, did you hear me? And I said, yeah, babe, I was just making sure you were done. I'm making sure you were finished. Because what kind of conversations do we have today, right? Somebody's talking a little bit, and then somebody else jumps in, somebody else jumps in, somebody else jumps in, right? And then you got all these voices going on. How much do you hear of that? We're only getting very, very small bits and pieces of those type of conversations. If you really want to know what's going on with someone, if you really want to try to understand them, stop, stop talking, Listen to what they're saying. Read into it as much as you can. Allow God's Spirit to give you discernment for Him to say this is what's going on with them. Say this because this is what they need to hear. Offer them this because this is what they need. You're looking, you're listening, you're looking by listening. But boy, we just don't do much of this in the age that we live in today. Because there's such a constant struggle for each and every individual to be heard. Do you know why there is? Do you, do you, you know something? I don't know how some of you text so fast. I mean, I, I just don't, I'm telling you. I don't know if it's, I even got a bigger phone. I didn't realize it was bigger. It's supposed to be the, well, it is the same size. But I think that the, the, the keypad is a little bit bigger, right? But I'm telling you, when I'm trying to answer somebody and it's just quick, you know, and I'm just trying to shoot a quick answer out there, it, they've already sent me three or four more text messages and I'm like, how are you doing that? I'm just trying to get my first thought straightened out, right? And then they'll send out those abbreviated letters sometimes and I hate to say it, but sometimes I'll say, what does that mean? I used to think LOL meant lots of love. I didn't know that it meant laugh out loud. I'm just being honest with you, right? But see, here again, that's how we communicate. And, and you know, it's hard to hear tone. It's hard to see facial expression. It's hard to see what's in a text. A text does not tell you everything that's behind the thought. It don't do it. You can actually mislead or misrep... Nah. Let me get the right word. You can actually misinterpret a text. 
You can think that someone is being haughty or high-minded because they, do you know what? I'm really, really careful sometimes when I'm answering people because I feel like if I don't answer the right way that they can read too much into that because we live into such a society where everybody's reading something into everything. So when I send out a text, sometimes I'm really, really busy at work and somebody texts me, right? And I want to try to get that quick text in and then I think to myself, no, I can't send it like that because if I do, then they're going to think I don't want to talk to them and really I just need to let them know I'm busy. So I'll take all this time to say, hey, I'm sorry, but I'm really busy right now. I'll have to give you a call later instead of just saying call you later. That's how my mind works. But a lot of people's mind, when it comes to texting, they understand just do these chop, chop, short, short. There you go. And if I can mention one more thing, and I, I'm not finding fault with it, but I do not like to have substantive conversations via text. If you've got something deep and important to share with me, if you are struggling with something, right? Now, it may be the only way that you can do that at the time. It may be the only way you feel like you can express that at the time. That's okay. But don't get mad at me when I say, I'm sorry, but I'm going to need to give you a call. Because I can't read everything that's going into that text, and I feel like that things are that vital that I need to be listening to you. You know... <laughs> I wish Brother Charles was here because I would hope that he would be able to verify this. But I'll tell you something that I do. I really take the time to listen to Brother Charles. There's two reasons for that. Sometimes when people get older, they feel like they're not being heard at all. Sometimes when people get older, they feel like people don't want to hear what they have to say. Also, Brother Charles, you'll find him constantly saying, Now, Brother Kenny, I don't want to be a burden to you. I said, Brother, you're not being a burden. But I do my best to try to listen to him because when you listen to Brother Charles, not only are you giving by listening, but you're also receiving by listening. Sister Clark, all the old different ones, all the folks over here, listen. But you know, I found that if you'll take some time to listen to children, you'll learn a lot as well. Learn to listen. Stop for just a minute. Just listen, pay attention. I want to share one more thing with you in the aspect of listening. Is I remember uh, during the Gulf War, I was in a foxhole. And I had two privates in there with me. And they kept wanting to talk. And I remember getting angry at them. And telling them... Uh, I can't tell you what I told them, but telling them, pretty much telling one, if you don't shut your mouth, I'm going to bust it with this rifle butt. I was listening because I was so afraid. I was listening for every little noise. I was listening, watching. I was hyper vigilant, right? And so what we need to realize is that when you're wrestling for a soul, it's that serious. When you're wrestling for one soul, it is that serious. You need to learn to sit back and give God an opportunity to observe, for people to observe your willingness to listen to them because not only does it show them that you're listening, but you know what it shows more than anything is that you're concerned enough about them to pay attention to what they're saying. I struggle with these big evangelists and stuff, you know, I really do. Big mega churches and because you, you know, I'll be in different places where there's a TV and you hear them talking about, you know, all these good things and everything else, but then down at the bottom is or they want you to buy that book or they want you to send that donation. It's all about the money coming in, right? And that's sad to me. It really is sad. 
learn, here's, here's a couple things, learn to, instead of answering questions, learn to question a question. <laughs> what do you mean, Brother Ken, question a question? Yeah, learn to question a question. If somebody says to you, for instance, you know, Brother Ken, why are you a Christian? You might answer back and say, why wouldn't you want to be a Christian? In other words, you tell me. We see Jesus doing this at different times, right? We see Jesus in the house when, when Mary Magdalene come in and poured the alabaster box over him and washed his feet. And we see him discerning the thoughts of Peter, the, the Pharisee, I think he was. I think he was a Pharisee, Sadducee, I don't remember. Anyhow, he, he discerns his thoughts and he asks him a question. What was the question? He said, Peter, if there's two men and one has a lot of sin and the other one has a little bit of sin and they're both forgiven, who do you think is going to be the most grateful? <laughs> and he said, well, I suppose who much is forgiven. And then Jesus begins to tell him, you've got the wrong attitude, pal. She hadn't ceased to wash my feet since I come in. You ain't even offered me a pail of water. You didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't do anything you were supposed to do. And she's done it all, and yet you're judging her. That's basically what Jesus was doing, and he had started it out by asking a question. It's pretty cool to me. Here's the last thing, and this one is so important if you're going to win a soul. Is have some humility. You know, when someone decides they don't want to hear it, be willing to back away from it. <clears throat> That same place where I worked, there was a man there who was Jehovah's Witness. And man, I'm telling you, there was a contest on for him to convert me and me to convert him. I mean, we were back and forth and back and forth. He's the first one who told me the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. And I didn't believe him, of course. I was a young Christian. I hadn't been saved very long. I rushed home that night and called Brother White in. I say, wait, where, where, where's the word Trinity at in the Bible? He says, well, Brother Ken, it ain't in the Bible. I'm like, What? How can we believe in Trinity if the word Trinity is not in the Bible? So I did my own study. I remember it was one of the first times I ever did a study on anything. And <clears throat> so I studied the Trinity for myself and we were, we'd been talking and man, he was just doing his best to convert me. And I, I'll be honest with you, I was doing my best to convert him too. And I'll never forget, I wrote down all these scriptures and I had them in my pocket and I folded them up in a piece of paper like this. <clears throat> And I stuck them down in my pocket like this, and I was running my machine, right? I'm running my machine. The whole time I'm running my machine, I'm like, God, if you want this man to have these scriptures, I want you to send him to me. Send him to me. I'm not going to go looking for him, Lord. And I promise you, just about the time that I got done saying that prayer, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I didn't even look. I kept running my machine, and I said, here's those scriptures you asked me for. He goes, how did you know it was me? I said, I just prayed God would send you over here so I could give you these. That happened. I'm telling you, that happened. So he took the scriptures and he come back. And when he come back, I said, what would you think? And he goes, well, I want to give you something. And he handed me watchtowers. He said, can you read these? And I did. I did. I read them. And I went back and I said, I'm sorry. I just don't get anything out of it. I said, it sound, looks to me like that there's a lot of ideas in there that man has. I don't see them lining up with the scripture. And if we don't have a foundation we can work off of, I can't work off the Bible and the Quran. As a Christian, I'm going to read the Bible. That's where I got to work from. That's where I got to start from. Anyhow, I'll never forget this. I said, brother, it's pretty obvious that I'm not converting you, and it's pretty obvious that you're not converting me. Could we just be friends? Really, Brother Ken? You can still be friends with somebody you didn't convert? Yeah, you sure can. Why are you going to have a bad attitude towards them? What if someday, Brother Preston, that man ever decided, right? What if he ever decided one day that he wanted to challenge what he believed and he showed up in church here and I had treated him bad because of what he believed? <laughs> you don't treat people bad because of what they believe. It's not working. That will not work. We remained friends. All the whole time I worked there. So there has to be some humility in winning a soul. Last scripture for tonight, if you go with me to the book of James in the New Testament, I appreciate you bearing with me. 
In James chapter 5, I want to read verses 19 and 20 here. He's talking about prayer, right? And he's talking about confessing our faults one to another, praying a prayer of faith. He's talking about Elijah being a man of subject of like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might rain and it rained not. He prayed earnestly that it didn't rain and rained not. For this, and then he prayed again and the heavens opened up and it gave rain. So in verse 19 it said, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. Now before I go much further, what does that mean, Preston? What do you think that indicates? If any of you do err from the truth. Is there a possibility that this means that he's referring to someone who's backslid? who walks away from truth, right? They err from it. In other words, because look, look how it's written. He said, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, that means you were already part of truth at one time and then you walked away from it, right? And one convert him. or In other words, brother Robert, one help him to get his way back to truth. Now, I'm going to say something here in the closing statement that a lot of times around the church when somebody backslid, it was almost like that they become lepers and you were supposed to stay away from them. I don't believe that. I believe that you should maintain every avenue of communication that you can and look for every opportunity that you can to offer them hope and help because they knew one time the goodness of God. They knew it. And they erred from it. I don't understand sometimes though, and I'm just being honest, and I remember that there was a big conversation about this on Facebook. Surprise, right? Big conversation on this on Facebook about when people leave a church, right, and they feel like they're not treated right. And there was one sister that got on there, and I'll never forget this, and she said, what I needed to do is to remember that I'm the one who left. And so it's not that people are intentionally trying to treat people wrong who leave. That's not what happens. It's kind of like the old cliche, out of sight, out of mind. It's like when you're not worshiping together, it's not that, it's that people dislike you anymore. We just don't see you anymore. And then here's the other kicker to that. Is there's times when people look for an excuse to leave because they want to live a different life and so they wind up being mad at someone so they find an excuse to leave or err from the truth. Listen, does it matter? Brother, you and I need to be concerned about converting them back to truth. That's what we need to be concerned with. We need to be concerned with leading them back to the truth. We need to look for every opportunity we can to reach out to them and once those opportunities are exhausted, then okay, but when you see them out, you show them love and kindness and goodness and mercy. He said, if one do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. To me, that's probably the most powerful statement when it comes to winning a soul. That's how important it is. So there's some things that I hope maybe will be helpful to us when it comes to working with the lost. There's some things that I hope will be helpful to us as we try and reach a lost and dying world. In the condition that our world's in today and all the drama that is in our world today, it's going to be very easy for us to be caught up in conversation about the things we talked about this morning. Very easy. How are we as God's children going to look for that conversation to talk about the things of God? How are we as God's children going to look for that opportunity to share Jesus with those folks? Humility is a big part of that. Amen. I hope the lesson spoke to some of us. I hope we got a little bit out of it. I know this, that the last, you know, that what I want to do more than anything is win another soul for the Lord. I want to have an impact on people's lives. I want to make a difference to them. And I know that that's not only going to be done by our words, but it's going to have to be done by our conduct. I can tell you this, that if your conduct is not 
becoming of your words, then your words are worthless. You can tell people all day long you're this, that, or the other, but if they don't see it, they're not going to believe it. Amen. Appreciate you all tonight. Please remember Brother Shane in prayer. Please remember Sister Nikki's parents, Brother and Sister Michael in prayer. Continue to pray for Sister Jane. Please continue to remember Brother David in prayer. Brother Josh Wilkins' bro, uh, Uncle Johnny is, ex, is very, very sick, desperately needs prayer, can't get out of bed. So please, please remember him in prayer. Continue to pray for each other concerning the virus, the protest, everything else that's going on. Let's hold each other up in prayer. Continue to use that text page and let people know how much you love them and appreciate them. That's what it's for. Continue to be an encouragement to one another, okay? And we want to thank the Lord for every one of you that was with us tonight, either here in the services or through Facebook. Um, services Wednesday night will all be virtual services. Sorry, Preston. The reason why they're all going to be virtual is uh, Brother Jason's going to be teaching on Wednesday night, and he's not comfortable yet coming out. So he would like to do virtual services, and that's fine. That's great. We've got that. I would like. I'm going to go ahead and text out the. Um, I'm going to text out the the uh, testimony line again. I got that from Brother Scott. And what I'd like for you to do is don't let that testimony line die. It's kind of like when we started back to services, people stopped calling that testimony line. But what I'd like for you to do is to remember to call in and give some of those testimonies on that so we can upload them on our Facebook page still. Um, if you got songs you want to turn in, keep turning those songs in. Anything that you want to turn in, it's just it will just enhance our page. So please remember that in prayer if you could, okay? All right, we're going to look to the Lord and be dismissed in prayer if you would bow your heads. Father, we thank you for being here with us today. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, give us a burden for the lost. Help us, Lord, to be able to communicate in such a way that people could see you in our lives. That, Lord, we'd have an effect on this lost and dying world, that we could shine and be bright, Father, in all the midst of this darkness. Thank you for each one that's been here. Bless them, help them, give them the strength that they need. Give us a good week, Lord. Bring us back together next week, God, please. Use the circumstances in our world today to stir up hearts, to lead people back to you, Lord. Help people to see that the answer to the problems in our lives is truly your son, Jesus. Father, we'll ask and praise you for all everything that's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. We see Jesus in the house when, when Mary Magdalene come in and poured the alabaster box over him and washed his feet. And we see him discerning the thoughts of Peter, the, the Pharisee, I think he was. I think he was a Pharisee, Sadducee, I don't remember. Anyhow, he, he discerns his thoughts and he asks him a question. What was the question? He said, Peter, if there's two men and one has a lot of sin and the other one has a little bit of sin and they're both forgiven, who do you think is going to be the most grateful? And he said, well, I suppose whom much is forgiven. And then Jesus begins to tell him, you got the wrong attitude, pal. She hadn't ceased to wash my feet since I come in. You ain't even offered me a pail of water. You didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't do anything you were supposed to do. And she's done it all, and yet you're judging her. That's basically what Jesus was doing. And he started it out by asking a question. <laughs>